Ed Meese was born into a deeply patriotic family committed to public service. His father worked in local government for five decades. His stories of serving the people of Oakland inspired Ed's lifetime of passion. After graduating from Yale in 1953, Ed attended the University of California at Berkeley Law School and served two years of active duty in the United States Army. In 1966, still the deputy district attorney of his native county, Ed was introduced to Governor-elect Ronald Reagan for the first time. At the end of a 30-minute one-on-one meeting, the new governor offered Ed a job. He said, this guy has the potential to be great. In 1980, Ed became a key leader in Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign. In the new administration, Ed was appointed counselor to the president. In that position, he drove sweeping reforms of the executive branch and ensured the departments worked together to achieve the administration's goals. In 1984, President Reagan nominated Ed Meese to be attorney general. Over the next three years, Ed would deliver monumental change for the American people. Perhaps Ed's greatest contribution to American law has been his unwavering advocacy for the legal principle that judges must adhere to the original meaning of the Constitution. After concluding a historic tenure as Attorney General, Ed joined the Heritage Foundation. Over his 30 years at Heritage, he helped create the Foundation's Legal and Judicial Studies Department, which is now named in his honor. Ed, for more than two decades, I've known you as an ally and advisor and uh, most of all as a trusted friend. I can think of no more appropriate Defender of the Constitution Award recipient than the 75th Attorney General of the United States, the Honorable Edwin Meese III. We're pleased that he continues to advise and mentor the Heritage Team and most of the lawyers of the conservative movement. I think we did a hell of a job, and that's thanks to this man we're honoring right here. Ed Meese is the indispensable man in the conservative movement. Simply stated, Ed Meese is the single most important living American conservative. He brought together all different sides of the conservative movement in what we call fusionist conservatism. His life is an authentic life of public service. Routinely, he has put duty to the country ahead of his own interests. Ed has advocated for effective law enforcement against overcriminalization and is always in defense of the Constitution and the system of government designed by our founders. The United States proudly honors Edwin Meese III, who has dedicated his life to serving our nation and protecting our liberties. Welcome, everybody, to our virtual Joseph Story Lecture. Uh, my name is John Malcolm. I'm the Vice President of the Institute for Constitutional uh, Government, but, but more germane uh, for, uh, for this event is that I'm the Director of the Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Because we are uh, in the midst of a pandemic and these are unusual times, uh, I am interviewing uh, General Meese here in his home, and what a pleasure and a privilege it is to, uh, to be here and doing this with you. Ed, I have to tell you, this is a particular pleasure for me. I, I remember actually when we first met, it was either 1990 or 1991, and I was a, a baby assistant U.S. attorney uh, in Atlanta, and I was in charge of inviting speakers to come to the National Convention for the Federalist Society, and I decided to take a flyer and invite you to come speak at a program on the over-federalization of crime. And, and to my amazement, uh, not only did you accept, but from the first time I met you, you insisted that I call you Ed, and I never dreamed uh, that at some point in my career I would have the privilege of directing the center that bears your name. So I'm, I'm just delighted to be spending this, uh, this time with you. Thank you, uh, John. It's good to be with you. Great. So I thought we would spend some time talking about your career and a little bit about the rise of the conservative legal uh, movement. And let's uh, let's start at the start. So where did you uh, grow up and where what did your parents do? Okay, I was born and grew up in Oakland, California, 
And my folks, my mother was a homemaker, and my dad was uh, a, actually the public servant of various sorts. When he got out of law school, uh, he uh, graduated from there, but didn't go into law practice right away. He was asked to become an assistant to a state senator in the state legislature, which he did. And then from there, he had a succession of jobs. I don't think he ever looked for work. Somebody came along with a, a job offer and he accepted or didn't accept as the case may be. So he then was a clerk of what was known in those days as the police court, be like a municipal court today. And then he became the chief deputy and ultimately the treasurer and tax collector of Alameda County, which is where Oakland is located. Wow, so it seems like you almost had a, a genetic predisposition both <laughs> to, to public service and also uh, to law enforcement. Well, actually it turned out that way, yes. Wow. So uh, you met your wife, uh, Ursula, I know, at Oakland uh, High School, isn't that right? That's right. Was it, was it love at first sight? Well, it, we certainly uh, enjoyed being with each other. It was not probably quite not as deep as love right at that, 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 that time, because after all, it took us a while before we finally got married. Yeah, well, I was, I was going to ask you, he says, you didn't get married until after law school. In fact, Ursula uh, referred to this as, uh, and I love this quote, a whirlwind courtship of 11 years. Uh, what, what took so long? <laughs> well, actually, uh, she was a year behind me in school. And so uh, when she was finishing uh, high school, I was already uh, uh, 3,000 miles away at Yale. And then uh, when I went, uh, came back and went in the Army after she had graduated from college, and then uh, after that, uh, again, we were in different parts of the country. I was in Oklahoma, and she was in California for a while, and then was back in, in Harvard in uh, the East Coast. We finally got together uh, around 1956, and uh, then dated quite a bit, and uh, ultimately got married just a couple of years later. You mentioned before that Ursula uh, went to Harvard. She's told me that she was one of the first people uh, sort of admitted to Harvard, what was now Harvard, Harvard Business School, uh, I, I guess, uh, and it was only a one-year year program. Uh, I, I guess they weren't sure whether, whether women would be able to hack it at that, uh, at that time. Right. The women had not been in the Harvard Business School, so they set up the Harvard Radcliffe Program in Business Administration. They could go for one year, I guess. They figured if they had two years of business training, they'd be too dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so she got a certificate in business administration after one year, and then uh, she, uh, after that, we uh, came back, both of us then wound up in California. That's great. Well, you attended uh, two institutions, Yale uh, College and then Bolt Hall, which is now Berkeley Law School, that are very, very different institutions today uh, than from the time you went to them. What was that, uh, what was that like attending those two schools? Well, at that time, they, uh, you're right, they were very different in many ways. The uh, Yale, for example, was... Uh, uh, pretty well balanced between conservatives and liberals. As a matter of fact, uh, in the political union, uh, the conservative party became the largest party in the political union, which is how I happened to become president of the political union. I had been chairman of the conservative party, and then we had more votes than anybody else, so that's why I became president. And then, uh, and of course, at the Bolt Hall at the law school, it, even back in 1950. 658 the time I was going there it was still a pretty pretty non-political in many ways most of us in my class were veterans we'd been in the in the service army or navy or marine corps or air force and uh, so it uh, really didn't have uh, the politicization that has taken place since that time yeah boy how times have uh, have changed so you've mentioned that you were president of the political union you know, you were also involved in a lot of other activities isn't that right well i was uh, Yes, uh, as my father-in-law once said, apparently I, I didn't allow my, uh, my uh, classes to interfere with my education. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was uh, president of the uh, Yale Political Union. As you mentioned, I was uh, president uh, of the uh, Yale Debating Association, uh, where I followed uh, by a couple of years uh, Bill Buckley, who had been previously been the president of that. And then I was, uh, I was the manager of track, and also I was the uh, cadet commander of the ROTC battalion there. Well, so you, let, let's pick up on that. So you, you joined the ROTC at Yale uh, and enlisted, and then you were commissioned as a second lieutenant uh, in the Army after graduating. You stayed in the military for quite some time, didn't yes, you? Yes, I, I, I spent about 30 years uh, in the Army Reserve after active duty, uh, retiring ultimately in 1984 
as a colonel. Uh, so after you graduated from law school in, in 1959, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, you went to work at the, at the district attorney's office in Alameda County. Uh, what made you decide to become a prosecutor and what was it like working in that office? Okay, the reason I became a prosecutor was because of a peculiar start to my legal career. Uh, when I was in the Army, I went into the Army between my first and second years of law school. And uh, so in the Army, in those days, special courts martial, which was the intermediate court between a summary court martial or a general court martial, in between, kind of like a municipal court. And uh, in those days, they didn't have lawyers. So uh, one law officer would be picked out as, to be the trial counsel or prosecutor. Another one would be assigned as the defense counsel, or the defendant could have their own private lawyer if they wished. But in any event, uh, I would happen to be assigned as the trial counsel. So I did a lot, actually tried a lot of cases wow. as a non-lawyer uh, during my army career. And that was an additional duty to the other things I did as a field artillery officer. And <clears throat> so when I went back to law school, I was very much interested in trial work. And when I graduated, I wanted to try cases. And so the district attorney's office, which is a very excellent office in Alameda County, <clears throat> had any vacancies and I applied and was fortunately accepted. But that's rather remarkable to think of courts martial being conducted by non well, that, that's yeah. sort of a moot court with real consequences. That's right, absolutely. <laughs> did you also, did you prosecute and defend? or? No, I just, uh, you were either a trial counsel or a defense counsel. Okay. And I was trial counsel. Because now I gather they, they, they rotate. You can be a prosecutor for a period of time and then a defense attorney for a period of well, time. Well, I think today it's entirely different. Right. They have a different cores of prosecutors and defense attorneys. And so you can go into the judge advocate general corps uh, as a lawyer and uh, could conceivably go to either prosecution or defense. Right. So I gather when you were in the, in the Alameda District Attorney's Office, there were riots uh, at, your, at your alma mater, and the governor at the time, Pat Brown, Jerry Brown's uh, father, uh, called you for advice. What, what happened? Well, uh, this was in the 1960s when the disorders on campuses was just beginning. It began roughly in the 1960, 61 period. This was 1964, and a group of students that called themselves the free speech movement. Although free speech, it was having it their way or else. But in any event, the free, free for speech, them, very costly for everybody else. Right. <laughs> they called themselves that. But, and about uh, over 700 of them had invaded Sproul Hall, which was the administration building of the Berkeley campus of the University of California. And so uh, by the time it came to be the end of the day that they, uh, that they were there, the question was what to do at this point. And the officials at the university and the uh, local police felt it was necessary to uh, take back, essentially take back the administration building to arrest those who wouldn't leave voluntarily. And so, but in order to keep this from becoming a whole mob scene with the rest of the campus. They had to have a perimeter that would uh, keep everybody away who was, and keep crowds back so that they could proceed with the arrests. The uh, Berkeley police, the Oakland police, and the sheriff's department were all engaged in that operation, but they needed some force to provide a perimeter to keep others away. <clears throat> the only logical one was the California Highway Patrol and so it was necessary to get the governor's permission. So the governor was on the phone with the officials there, the sheriff and others, and he, wanted, he said, is there anyone there from the district attorney's office? And they pointed out that I was there among others, and he asked to talk to me. So he asked whether we thought it was necessary to go ahead with this and whether we needed the highway patrol. And I said, yes, that was the consensus of all the police executives there. And so on that basis, he said, well, okay, go ahead. I take it that was your, your first contact with the governor of well, California. No, I had actually met him before, ah. and that's why he had asked for me uh, when he heard my name that I was there, because I had done the legislative work on behalf of all of the district attorneys, chiefs of police, and sheriffs of California in 1961, because my boss, the district attorney, was the chairman of their legislative committee of that group. And so it was traditional for one of his deputies to go up to the state capitol and represent him and inferentially the entire law enforcement community 
before the state legislature. Only two years out of law school and to go I, up to Sacramento? I, and right, I had that experience. Wow. Were you involved in any of the, were there, were there prosecutions after these riots? Were you involved in that at all? Yes, we, uh, we had a, a massive set of prosecutions. Started off with 150 cases. That, and uh, we had developed a system so that the individuals could be identified of when they were arrested to have the police officers standing next to them and then having a Polaroid shot taken so that later on they were not anonymous. They could be identified as the specific people who were arrested by specific officers. And that was very effective. It enabled us to identify and then convict. So we convicted about 771 out of the 773 who had been arrested. So two people got off? Two people hardly got off. Unfortunately, they died in accidents during the pendency of the trial. And so they went to a higher tribunal. Right. <laughs> well, so you, you talked about your relationship with the, with the police. I gather you spent a lot of time uh, riding around in patrol cars uh, with the police. What, why did you do that, and what did that experience teach you? Well, there were a couple of reasons. One, I did a lot of training of police, training in laws of arrest, training in police operations, investigation of crimes uh, with the prosecution in mind, uh, investigation of traffic accidents, that sort of thing. And so one of the ways I needed to learn about these things was to actually be out there with the police, uh, observing what they were doing, observing the conditions under which they operated, so I could ask intelligent questions during the uh, trials that, that followed. And also, uh, on particular cases where I, was, uh, where I had a police officer as a witness, rather than take them off their beat or bring them in on their own time, I would visit them on their beat where they were actually patrolling the, the streets and uh, have a chance to talk with them and learn their what information they had, but also to go to the scene of the crime and actually understand the physical circumstances in which a crime was committed. All of this was helpful then in the ultimate prosecution. So you have a special connection uh, with the police that continues to this day. I mean, I'm in meetings with you with police officers and they, they hold you appropriately so with a degree of reverence. Did, did that special connection begin around this time? Yes, in a way, but in some ways it had actually be begun when I was much younger because with my dad being the clerk of the police court knew almost all the police officers and he would bring home stories about things that he, that he had learned from them, uh, stories about individuals. So I was somewhat familiar with policing uh, as a kid. And then of course, later on in the district attorney's office really cemented that relationship at that time. So is it true that on your honeymoon, you took time out to go visit police headquarters? Well, <laughs> my wife and I were in California. We actually had gone to Disneyland on our honeymoon. And so uh, it just happened that the Los Angeles Police Department had opened up one of the most new, modern police headquarters in the country. And so uh, while we were there, I uh, decided it might be a good time just to have a the tour that they were offering at the time. And so that turned out to be very well. You have a more forgiving wife than I do. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, uh, about Ronald Reagan. So you, you first met, then I guess, I guess Governor-elect Reagan in 1966. Um, how did that meeting come about, and, and what were your impressions of him? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I had done this legislative work in 1961, uh, and so uh, I was known to a few people in Sacramento in the state capitol. So in 1966, when Ronald Reagan had been elected governor, and he was looking around to form a cabinet and to form heads of the various departments, so he was essentially had a group of people on a, on a talent hunt. And uh, one of the things that happened was a, a senator that I had worked with some five years before remembered me and re recommended me to Ronald Reagan for the position of legal affairs secretary. And so I was invited to come up and meet the new governor-elect. <clears throat> I had not met, met him before or been in, involved in his campaign. I'd heard a lot about him. And uh, so I came up and uh, met him and he brought me in, had a private interview, just the two of us, for about a half hour. And I was tremendously impressed with two things. Number one, his friendliness and uh, good nature. 
And secondly, he knew a lot about subjects that I was very familiar with in criminal justice and a lot of good ideas. And most of the things we talked about in the criminal justice arena were we were very much in agreement on different things like the death penalty and, and clemency and uh, pardons for, for certain uh, people who had completed their, their penalty and so on. And so uh, as, a, as a result, at the end of the half hour, he surprised me by offering me the job, and I surprised myself by accepting on the spot. <laughs> and the toughest part was driving home 75 miles to Oakland to figure out how to explain to my wife that we would be moving. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that was quite a conversation. Uh, so you didn't know at the time that you were engaging in a job interview. You thought you were just there to sort of inform the governor-elect about things that you knew about? Well, it was actually, it had to do with the possibility of a job, right. Right. but certainly it was... I did not realize that it would happen that day that I went up there. So when you were working for Governor Reagan, I gathered it was a little bit more of a problem uh, up at Berkeley uh, and that there were more <laughs> riots in which uh, a building, I believe, was firebombed. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how the governor reacted to that? Yes. Uh, this was in 1969, and they had a, an episode called the Pupils Park episode. <clears throat> and there were. There uh, was rioting and there was a certain amount of uh, burning of buildings and uh, throw, throwing of built bricks and rocks and sharpened steel spikes at police officers. It was a major uh, uprising. And so the governor, at the request of the local police, uh, brought in the National Guard. And literally within the days, uh, the uprising ended and peace was restored. Were you involved in that in yes, the decision making on that? Uh, I was actually went to the scene on at the request of the governor to provide a liaison with between him and the uh, the police and sheriff's deputies and so on that were and the national guard uh, one of my responsibilities as a member of the cabinet was uh, the national guard of california uh, and so uh, and also with the the uh, state office of Mem of emergency services which was the uh, body that that arranged the mutual aid between police departments and sheriff's departments. And so it was natural for me then to more or less be his representative on the scene. And you got it done, you handled pretty quickly. It, it, it was indeed, yes. Yeah, I think there's some governors today who could uh, probably <laughs> learn to take a, a page from the Ronald Reagan I think, I think that's right. Yeah. And what he did was he had, he uh, promoted the unity between the various levels of government and the fact that everybody was playing from the, from the same plan meant that this could, that there was no chance then that the opposite groups uh, could ultimately prevail. Mm. So while you were working for Governor Reagan, I gather you were instrumental in founding what was one of the first uh, conservative <clears throat> public legal interest groups, and that was the Pacific Legal Foundation. How did that all come about? Well, Ronald Reagan became tired of having the welfare reform program constantly attacked, uh, sometimes in the, in the news media, other times in litigation. And these lawsuits were brought by so-called public interest lawyers who were actually uh, paid for by federal funds. And so he was tired of the taxpayers having to fund lawyers who were essentially working against the best interests, not only of the taxpayers, but also of the people who were on welfare. And so as a result, uh, it was felt that we needed organizations who would provide uh, on the side of of the taxpayers and the law-abiding citizens would provide the same kind of resources that the spenders and the opposing party, the uh, so-called welfare rights organization groups such as that had. And so that was the origin of two organizations. One was a think tank or a public policy research organization known as the Institute for, Contem for Contemporary Studies. And the other was the Pacific Legal Foundation which was to provide a, a publicly funded, uh, through voluntary contributions, uh, a, an organization that would provide the representation for the ordinary citizens who were being sued or, uh, for, or who were, or governmental entities that were being sued, uh, such as the welfare program in California. Were you involved in terms of coming up with the plans for those organizations and recruiting the leadership? Well, uh, the organizations, uh, there were a couple of people. The California Chamber of Commerce was very much involved. 
and actually provided a, uh, a president for the Pacific Legal Foundation. And then we came up with some top-notch lawyers, including Ron Zumbrin, who was the initial uh, chief counsel and later president of the Pacific Legal Foundation, which was really the first uh, general purpose public interest law firm that was funded by private enterprise uh, in the country. Mm. And from it proceeded then what is known today as the conservative legal movement. So after Ronald Reagan left the governor's mansion uh, between 1974 and 1980, you worked for years as uh, in-house counsel at an aerospace company. You worked briefly at a law firm. You taught at law school. Uh, you served as the vice chairman of a California organized crime control commission. That's a lot of experiences. Can you talk a little bit about some of those? I enjoyed the private practice. I was in of counsel with a very good group of lawyers in a very small firm. I think we had six lawyers, which uh, today is minuscule compared <laughs> to most of the large law firms. But uh, it was a very good group, and we covered all kinds of law, everything from criminal law, estate planning, the whole works. I did mostly uh, a little corporate law and some general law practice, family law to some extent. So it was a, re a real variety, and I had a chance to look at different aspects of the law, of the law during this time. I worked uh, on a number of uh, political uh, issues, such as uh, state initiatives. I had clients who uh, were uh, planning and uh, promulgating state initiatives in California. So it was really a, a great variety of things that I was able to look, to look at during that time. And it was while that time, while I was uh, in private practice, that I was invited to become a member of the State Organized Crime Commission, which was... Uh, uh, convened by the Attorney General, Evel Younger, and ultimately became Vice President of that commission. And we worked with uh, the State Department of Justice and with uh, various sheriff's departments and police departments on potential and actual organized criminal organ organizations and activities within California. Did you have field hearings and hear from witnesses? We did. We heard, had hearings uh, in various parts of the state and also had regular briefings by the Division of Law Enforcement of the State Department of Justice. Was organized crime a major problem in California at the it, time? It was a growing problem where it was not, I would not say a major problem in the sense of a large amount of it, but there was sufficient amount and it appeared to be on the rise. And that was the purpose of this commission, to uh, nip it in the bud, so to speak, so it did not become a major problem for California. And what sorts of actions did you end up taking? Uh, well, first of all, the exposure of these criminal syndicates and uh, then public exposure of what law enforcement was doing to combat it and also to uh, warn business organizations that they, so that they would not be infiltrated by organized crime. Mm. You also taught law school then, didn't you? Well, I did. I, uh, I became a professor at... Uh, the uh, University of San Diego School of Law, and actually uh, was able to continue a small part of my l law practice uh, while I was doing that, but I enjoyed very much. Uh, I founded a, the uh, Institute for Criminal Law Research there, uh, the uh, Center for Criminal Justice Policy and Management, which not only taught law students, and particularly graduate students, but also uh, taught uh, various public officials like investigators and uh, lawyers in, in district attorney's offices on special programs there. What did you teach in law school? What, what I taught uh, primarily criminal justice. I had a criminal justice seminar, and I also taught uh, criminal law, basic criminal law, <clears throat> for uh, law students. Did you ever, were you ever thinking about you know, possibly going into academia permanently, or was that well, not interesting? Well, I probably would have uh, been. I was teaching full-time. And so, uh, and also running this uh, Criminal Justice Institute. So uh, I probably would have been in, in there full time if uh, Ronald Reagan hadn't run for office right. for president again. Right. Uh, so, I, so you were down in San Diego at the time. You, right. you, you, you covered the entire state. You went from right. Sacramento all the way down to, uh, to San Diego. It's right. A, it's, a, it's a big and beautiful state. Uh, so what did Governor 
Reagan do when he, he left the governor's mansion? I gather he, didn't, he did not go back into the movies. No, no, Ronald Reagan said uh, the reason he couldn't uh, go back into the movies was they had changed quite a bit from his heyday. And he said he, couldn't, uh, he didn't feel comfortable taking his clothes off in public. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, what he did was he uh, did a number of things. He did a good, good deal of public speaking. Uh, which uh, he had started, really, even while he was in Hollywood. And his General Electric uh, yeah, the, uh, days. the General Electric Theater and, and Death Valley days, things like that. But he also then uh, did a good deal of writing uh, on uh, topics related to public policy. And then he had a, a series of five-minute radio spots on the radio uh, on, uh, during each day, uh, Monday through Friday. So as a result of this, he was able to keep up with current events and, talk, and give commentaries on major issues that were facing the public. How did you settle on George Bush? And of course, you know, during the campaign, he had referred to uh, Ronald Reagan's supply-side economics as voodoo economics. <laughs> was, was that an issue that came up during this decision? Well, obviously it was. And that was why the president was very clear of asking uh, George if he could support all of his programs and policies. But uh, one of the things that we knew, uh, a small group of us knew, was a poll that we had commissioned back in June among about 12 people, all of whom, each of whom was conceivably a potential vice presidential candidate. And the poll showed that the two people who brought the most to the ticket would be Jerry Ford, and George Bush. I see. So that was one reason. The other was, uh, and th I mentioned this when I was talking with the governor, was that George really, for the most part, had con conducted himself very, very honorably during the primary campaign. As to the voodoo economics, uh, as I said to the press when they asked me about it then, I said that George had an exorcism while he was in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> an effective one, too. <laughs> that is and as it turned out, George Bush definitely was one of the best vice presidents that any president has ever had. He was totally loyal, very helpful, and he brought to the ticket, actually, uh, the one thing the president didn't have was war Washington experience. George had been director of the CIA. He'd been ambassador to China. He'd been uh, uh, a congressman. Right. So he knew the Washington scene, and combined with the policy views that Ronald Reagan brought from California, it was a, a great match, actually. Yeah, and a, 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 a decorated fighter pilot, as I recall. He had been a, well. a fighter pilot in the Navy, right. Mm. So let's talk about a number of things that happened during, during the Reagan years. And I suppose mm. pretty early on was, uh, was the assassination attempt. Which right. John Hinckley uh, shot the president. It's a, the Washington Tilton is very, very near my house. I think about it every time I, I yeah. go by there. So talk about that. Well, just weeks after the inauguration... Uh, Hinckley uh, shot the president uh, uh, through a, a delusional uh, feeling that somehow this would help him win the affections of a movie star. And Jody Foster. Uh, Jody Foster. So uh, actually this was a real test at a time when we were very new to all of this, uh, having the president in the hospital uh, literally fighting for his life and uh, having been seriously wounded. That was downplayed at the time. I, it was I, downplayed at the time, the seriousness of the wound. Actually, it was not initially discovered of how serious it was, but in any event, <clears throat> the main thing was to be sure, to assure the public that this new team that was less than two months old uh, was able to carry on and do what was necessary then to, uh, to carry on the business of government. And so we worked very hard at that. The vice president stepped in, but he was very careful not to uh, usurp any of the powers of the, that belonged only to the president. For example, when he, the pres uh, vice president was coming back from uh, Texas, where he had given a speech, I believe, and uh, there was some thought that he ought to land, at, after landing at Andrews Air Force Base, should helicopter into the White House like the president would. And he said no. Uh, he, instead, he went by helicopter to his own uh, residents up in the Naval Observatory so that it did not look like he was trying to step into the, the place of the president. 
but then he carried out the convening of the cabinet and the other things necessary to make sure that the business of government continued. And Ronald Reagan, of course, uh, during his recuperation, took care of signing bills or making decisions that had to be done. But it was really worked very smoothly and uh, was very reassuring to the public, particularly the graceful way in which the president himself reacted, cracking jokes right. while he was waiting surgery to remove the bullet. Things like that. I remember what he, he said something like he, he told the surgeon that he hoped that he was a Republican. And, yeah, right. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, the, the, the president said, uh, I hope you're all, to the doctors just before he went under the anesthetic, I hope you're all Republicans. And one of the doctors says, Mr. President, we're all Republicans today. <laughs> and uh, when, when I got to the, uh, to the hospital, uh, along, uh, I brought Jim Baker with me and a couple of others. And Mike Deaver, who had been with the president, was there and met us as we went to the door of the hospital. <clears throat> and uh, just at that time, the three of us were there together, and the president was wheeled by us on the, going from the emergency room up to the operating room. And he looked at us and he said, who's minding the store? <laughs> <laughs> and he was kind of wisecracking like that. Uh, and that, that grace under fire, so to speak, reassured the public not only was he in good shape, but the government was in good shape. So you, you pointed out that George Bush assumed control in a modest way. Very. I remember when, when Al Haig came out and said that he was in charge, <laughs> did George Bush have to wrestle that away from Al Haig? No, actually, uh, I think Al Haig got a, a raw deal on that. Okay. Al had been down in the Situation Room and was watching on television, and of course the news media were playing this up, and uh, the, a question was asked of, of Larry Speaks, who was the assistant uh, press secretary. Uh, Larry, who's actually in charge? Uh, one of the reporters said, the president, the vice president's on a plane en route from Texas, the president's in the hospital, who's really in charge? And Al saw this and realized that, uh, that uh, our opponents, the Soviets, for example, or some other foreign power, might think that there was a gap in the government and that would try to take advantage of this. And that was when he went running upstairs to the press room and where he said, not, not necessarily accurate in terms of the Constitution, <laughs> but nevertheless said, uh, as of now, I'm in control. And uh, that, of course, then was played up and uh, he was given a bad time. Right, right. So he wasn't thinking about presidential He succession. was not thinking about taking over the presidency. Okay. So let's talk about a few of the things that, that got accomplished during those years. So just mm -hmm. as, as the president had done when he was governor, uh, there were the Reagan tax cuts. Right. Uh, let's talk about that. Well, when the president took office, the country economically was in very deep trouble. Uh, we had high inflation. We had a stagnant economy. We had high unemployment and so on. <clears throat> and he felt that necessarily to stimulate the economy, uh, it was necessary to do four things. One was to cut taxes across the board. Secondly, to reduce the number of regulations, unnecessary regulations and rules that were, were uh, uh, hampering business and industry. Uh, thirdly, to have uh, stable monetary policies, working with the Fed. And fourth, to slow the growth of federal spending. But the top of these was to provide a tax cut because people were in very deep personal financial trouble because prices were so high. And the tax cuts were one of the ways to stem uh, the economic problems to give people more money in there and so that they could afford the higher prices as prices ultimately came down as inflation was curbed obviously a very difficult thing to get through. It was difficult to get through, but but uh, fortunately it was in fact uh, voted, uh, I guess in the summer of, of 1906, uh, 1981. Right, there was a huge economic uh, boom. And then uh, of course the curtailing of, of, of spending right. became a little bit of a difficult uh, thing. In the that present. was extremely difficult. Uh -huh. And while the, the growth of federal spending was curtailed for the most part, the one area where it was not uh, necessarily, it was not uh, curtailed, it was actually ex expanded spending in terms of the military. Right. Because uh, our military capability was at a low ebb in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. And so it was necessary to, ex to spend uh, considerable amounts of money to improve 
the conditions of the military manpower uh, to improve the equipment that had been uh, downgraded and also to improve weapon systems to match the Soviet Union's capability. There were several significant events that occurred during the Reagan presidency in, in terms of his dealing with the Russians. Uh, can, you, can you talk some more about that? Sure. Well, there were several things, uh, as you point out. And by the way, uh, we found uh, after the end of the Soviet Union and looking at the records that uh, were there in Moscow, uh, that actually it was the action in curbing the illegal activities of the traffic controllers that convinced many of the Soviet leaders that they had a, a new kind of president, a president who would be very tough and was, I think, instrumental in creating a climate in which the ultimate okay. end of the Soviet Union was possible. But anyway, there were several things that occurred. One of the ideas that the president had was to engage the Soviet Union on a moral plane. He talked about them uh, he gave a speech in 1982 in, in Westminster before the British Parliament in which he talked about consigning uh, Marxism-Leninism, as he called it, to the, to the ash heap of history and rallied the, the Western forces of freedom to fight against the Soviet Union and to stop their aggression, for one thing. He also supported freedom fighters around the world whether Angola or whether in Poland or whether in Nicaragua, wherever it happened to be. All of these things uh, were very important. And he did it on a moral basis uh, because of what he called the Soviet Union in the speech for the National Evangelicals Association. He talked about them being an evil empire mm. and, and essentially identified them for what they were and how they were oppressing the captive nations that they had conquered. And so uh, there were several, this speech about the evil empire was another thing that he had done beside the, the London speech. Then the, he gave a speech in Moscow uh, to the University of Moscow, to the students there. He gave the speech at Brandenburg Gate, which he called on Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. All of those things had to do with leading up to the fact that he was going to contend against and the support of freedom fighters, as I mentioned. All of this showed that he was definitely in a position to contend against what had been happening with the Soviet Union, exerting their communist philosophy throughout the world. So some of these speeches that you talked about, you know, speaking to the parliament and talking about consigning the Soviet Union to the ash heap of history and, and, and certainly to the National Association of Evangelicals referring to the Soviet Union as the evil empire. Were there people within the White House who were saying, oh, don't do that? Was this a matter of controversy? Well, there were some uh, that felt that, but most of the opposition came from the State Department, the uh, striped pants group, as the president called them. <laughs> and uh, a lot of them said, no, you, can, you shouldn't do that. That's not, not being diplomatic. Well, the president felt that the aggression by the Soviet Union was not diplomatic either. And uh, therefore, that the only way in which you could really contend against the Soviet Union, what they were doing, was to take firm stands and to accurately identify them for what they were doing. And it was this that really brought, back, brought out the uh, appreciation of the people in the captive nations and the fact that somebody was now standing up and telling the truth about... Uh, the, the USSR was to them uh, tremendously helpful, particularly in those people who were involved in the freedom movements in these various countries. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. So, so part of this, you referred to the military buildup that was yeah. going on in the Reagan doctrine. How critical was that? Well, actually building up our military capability was absolutely critical. And it wasn't just the resources, the uh, equipment, and even the pay and living conditions. It was the fact that Ronald Reagan uh, reinstilled pride in the military, that the people, he, by visiting army posts and Air Force uh, and Navy bases, actually flying out to ships at sea and uh, watching Navy maneuvers, things like that, he indicated his appreciation and his 
reverence for the military, and that inspired a lot of people in the country also having the same appreciation for what the military was there for and what they were doing. And it certainly also brought to the attention of the Soviet Union the fact that we not only were building up the military, but that they had the full support of the federal government behind them. And so all of these things had to do with creating the climate, which ultimately later on would lead to the end of the Cold War. And uh, the president uh, would uh, also build up our intelligence capabilities, having Bill Casey as the director of central intelligence. And he also uh, then launched something which was particularly significant, and that was the Strategic Defense Initiative. Right. So let's talk about the Strategic Defense Initiative. So when the president took office, the, the policy at the time, or everyone believed that, that our relationship with the Soviets was based on mutually assured destruction or mad uh, at the time. Uh, so you know, no, one, no one would fight because it would be an immediate counterattack. Uh, and the president pivoted in a different direction, and he, he sort of started with the strategic defense initiative that was mockingly at the time referred to as Star Wars. Uh, I actually think it was, it was pretty good in terms of capturing the imagination of what could be for the public. But, but tell me about the SDI. Well, Ronald Reagan was always had been opposed to nuclear war, uh, all the way back to it being in the governor's office. And he said that a nuclear war could never be won and should never be fought. And so he was looking for a way in which to counter that threat of a nuclear missile attack. So uh, as a matter of fact, he thought of MAD, this mutually assured destruction idea. He said that was kind of like two Western cowboys with six guns pointed at each other's head standing in front of a bar. And he thought that that was not a very stable way to look at the future of the world. So he initiated... Uh, with the support and help of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a program to come up with a counterforce to nuclear war, which would be a defense against ballistic missiles. And this was what he denominated the Strategic Defense Initiative. And that started, he announced it to the public in 1983 in a, a White House uh, announcement with the Joint Chiefs. And uh, it began the development. And today, if we had continued at the same tempo as it was, the development was going when he was president, we probably would have a complete system in, in effect. But we have had partial programs. The, one of the aspects of Strategic Defense Initiative was adopted by the Israelis and has provided them a weapon against the attack, the missile attacks from their opponents in that region. Yeah, the Iron Dome. The Iron right. Dome and other things. And so we have, again, we have a, aspects of it in being today, but it was certainly a major change. It was a major change not only in terms of the state of combat capabilities of the two sides, but also it showed the Soviet Union that we had the technology to do it. And they knew that this was something where we would eclipse what they had done illegally and in violation of the uh, anti-ballistic missile treaty, they had been trying to develop such a ballistic missile defense, and they found with our technology we were already going to surpass them. That was an, a reason, another reason why ultimately the Soviet Union was going to lose in the long run. So I know that the Soviets, there were a series of summits including one in, in Reykjavik, Iceland, in which uh, Mikhail Gorbachev basically made an offer to the United States that he, he thought that Reagan couldn't refuse to trade away Star Wars. Talk, talk about that. Well, uh, in the second uh, summit meeting uh, in Reykjavik in uh, 1986, <clears throat> uh, they had gone for two or three days and in many ways surprising the assembled people from the, from the United States, uh, Gorbachev was willing to give up about half of, of their nuclear weapons and an amazing uh, array of concessions. And uh, Ronald Reagan was very impressed and was in very much in agreement that and realizing that this could be a major move towards relieving of tensions 
and towards peace in the world. <clears throat> and so uh, it looked like things were going very well until the last morning when uh, Gorbachev played what he thought was his ace in the hole by saying, of course, in order to get this, you would have to give up your research and development of the Strategic Defense Initiative. Well, with that, Ronald Reagan realized what the game was from the Soviet side, and he said no, and ended the discussions at that point and came home. The press and everybody said that that was really a, uh, a great defeat for the president, when actually it turned out later that that was one of the key milestones that let the Soviet Union know that they would never be able to win and showed the mettle of the president and his willingness and steadfastness to do the right thing despite what the ramifications publicity-wise might be. So you talked before about uh, the president's relationship with, uh, with freedom fighters. And I want to uh, talk about his relationship with three people in, in, in particular, one of whom was certainly a freedom fighter. Uh, so you know, with Lady Margaret Thatcher, uh, Pope John Paul II, and then later president of Poland, but at the time the head of Solidarity, Lech Walesa. Can you talk a little bit about those relationships? Sure. Well, Ronald Reagan, as I mentioned, was uh, part of his uh, approach to the Soviet Union was to uh, support freedom fighters, uh, such as Lech Walesa. But the whole idea of giving this support was something that he shared with uh, Margaret Thatcher and the Pope as well as obviously with Valenza. But, uh, and he felt that it was very important to provide hope for people who were at that time being oppressed, particularly through uh, Eastern and Central Europe. And so it was a key part of building morale, you might say, among those who, who were still yearning for freedom and willing to take steps to move toward, in that direction. It was a key point in the overall combination of things with improving military capability in dealing with the Soviets on a moral basis and then allowing and encouraging other people to join the fight against Soviet imperialism. So talk a little bit about his relationship with Margaret Thatcher well, and the Pope. <laughs> with Margaret Thatcher, when they went to their first industrial summit together in uh, the summer of 1981, uh, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were the only two right of center leaders there, the only two conservatives. Everybody else was a socialist, whether it was Germany or France, whatever it happened to be. <clears throat> so it was uh, kind of the two of them against the world. <laughs> but they got along very well. Ronald Reagan had met Mrs. Thatcher in uh, London when he had been there during the 1970s and thought highly of her then and thought even more highly of her as he saw her doing the same thing in Britain as he was doing in the United States, which was reviving the economy and uh, rebuilding the spirit of the people. And of course, the Pope had this, his own reasons, both as a Pole himself, as well as based upon the oppression of religion in the uh, Soviet-dominated countries. And uh, so it was a natural opportunity for people who had mutual objectives and mutual basic philosophies of, of freedom to be able to work together informally and to, to a certain extent co uh, coordinate their efforts and bring their efforts together in, in furtherance of uh, expanding freedom in the world. Special relationships at a remarkable time. So, Ed, let's get back a little bit to sort of your, your career. So you transitioned from being a White House counselor uh, to the Department of Justice in, in, I guess it was February 1985, uh, to become the 75th Attorney General. But it, it took 13 months for you to get confirmed. I, I think at one point you might have said a joke like something like, well, I was nominated in February and confirmed in March. That's not so bad. But <laughs> there's a, a, year, yeah. a year gap there. What, what was that all about? Oh, that was a, a lot of uh, political machinations at the time. Just as we're having today, uh, the, uh, there was the opposition party in the Senate uh, was a, a difficult 
And so there were a lot of, uh, there were some false accusations and so on about uh, federal forms being filled out. So uh, it took a while to get this done. Independent counsel investigation, which exonerated me. And uh, ultimately, I was able to take the oath of office in February of 1985. Hmm. So let's talk about some of the things that you did as attorney general. Uh, so one of the more controversial things was you established a commission on pornography. How did that well, uh, come about? Yeah, actually, I didn't establish it. Uh, that came about, began really while I was still in the White House. So that was William French Smith. And began. William French Smith, the, uh, my predecessor as attorney general, uh, actually what happened was a group came to the president, asked for a meeting with the president, and it involved uh, clergymen, it involved psychiatrists, teachers, involved uh, child specialists, um, physicians, and they talk, talked to the president about uh, the uh, extensive amount of obscenity and pornography, which they felt were having a deleterious effect on the children of the United States and uh, many adults as well. And so they asked for a commission on pornography to be, uh, to be launched to find out what the situation was and whether, what the harm was. So uh, there had been such a commission launched by President Nixon in the 1970s. And uh, at that time, they came up with the conclusion that pornography was not really much of a problem. But by 19, in the 1980s, uh, it was far different. And so this commission which uh, was begun in 1984, uh, actually 19, uh, yes, in 84, before I became Attorney General, by, under my predecessor, brought their report in in 1985 when I was Attorney General. So as a result, the uh, media denominated the result as the report of the Mies Commission. Right. So that, I got more credit than I deserve. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, they had three very important findings. Number one was the ubiquitousness, the extent to which pornography was available at that time uh, and obscenity. Uh, number two, the harm that it was actually doing. The psychiatrists, for example, were very definite about the harm that it was, was being done. And thirdly, the fact that organized crime was a principal factor in the, in the distribution or the manufacture distribution and supplying of, of this type of material. And so all of these things then led to a considerable amount of legislation uh, that was the result of this report. And uh, then the implementation of that legislation in the Department of Justice by the creation of an obscenity enforcement unit right. within the criminal division. Yeah, I actually oversaw that unit huh. when I was a, a deputy assistant attorney general. I'd like to talk a little bit about the anti-drug campaign under the Reagan administration, you know, with Nancy Reagan and, and her Just Say No uh, uh, campaign. It was actually, at, at the time, you know, it, it was quite successful because drug use dropped among high school students. I have it here that, that uh, high school uh, seniors, 54% had, uh, had reported uh, taking drugs in 1979. It was down to 29% uh, by 1991. Uh, talk a little bit about the anti-drug campaign. Okay. Uh, as you point out, uh, the use of illegal drugs was pretty rampant in the 1960s and 1970s to reach a peak in 1980. And so when President Reagan took over, that was one of the major problems that he had to deal with. And so uh, in 1982, he brought a coordinator into the White House who worked directly with me for, to develop a strategy to deal with the problem of drugs on a national and international basis. And it had five points, five uh, aspects of it. Number one, uh, international cooperation against drugs. Uh, number two, strengthened law enforcement activity. Uh, number three, improved uh, rehabilitation and treatment programs for those people who got involved with drugs. Number four, education and prevention activities to keep people from getting involved with drugs. And fifth, expanded research to deal with the harm of drug abuse. So uh, as a result of this, uh, and as a result of, for example, when I was Attorney General at the President's direction, we formed the National Drug Policy Board where virtually all members of the cabinet were a part of the effort to deal with drugs 
in one of these five areas and uh, where the board itself met on a monthly basis at the policy level and then their subordinates, head of the, of the Drug Enforcement Administration, the FBI, people in the Health and Human Services area and so on, uh, worked on a day-to-day -day basis on the, you might call the street level or the public level. And the, the, the group, uh, the board itself set the policies which were then implemented by all the people in the other levels of government. And the whole effort then, and by the way, the president himself was very much interested, met with the board on a regular basis to learn the progress and to make sure that the, the effort was expanding and had the cooperation throughout the government. As a result of all of this, in that 10-year period from, uh, from 1982 to 1992, Drug abuse, as you point out, was right. reduced significantly. Roughly, overall, probably about 50% among adults and students, or student age kids uh, throughout the country. So it was probably one of the major accomplishments of the Reagan administration, beside what happened to the Soviet Union. And it was uh, because of this, uh, crime materially decreased as well. So that there were uh, there were other factors too in regard to crime, including increased uh, uh, imprisonment of serious habitual criminals for a longer periods of times and so on. But the overall effect of uh, reducing drug abuse was a material matter in terms of reducing crime in the United States. So let's talk about one of the uh, one of the things that happened. Uh, for which you're best known within the conservative legal community, and, and rightfully so, which is the debate about originalism uh, that, I, that was kicked off, I guess, in July of 1985 with a speech you gave uh, at the American Bar Association called The Jurisprudence of Original Intention. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that. Okay. Well, in 1985, uh, I was asked to speak to the ABA, the American Bar Association, and they... Uh, about every 10 years or so, they had a, a very large meeting. And half of the meeting was in Washington. The other half of the meeting was in London. And so uh, as I gathered with the, the staff, as I usually did when I was going to make a speech to talk about what we ought to talk about, uh, kind of the sentiment of, of all of us was we shouldn't make this, this just kind of an ordinary welcome to Washington type speech, but should talk about something substantive. And one of the problems that Ronald Reagan had been very much concerned about was judges who would obey the law as it was actually written and would follow the Constitution as the words really were written and what they meant, rather than substituting their own personal biases or policy preferences for what the law said. And so we decided to get back to talk about the idea of something that Bob Bork had started really back in 1971 with an article in the Indiana Law Journal about originalism, in other words, getting back to what are the original meaning of the Constitution, what's the original meaning and understanding of the laws. And so that's what I talked about. It was, uh, and I talked about how the Supreme Court in several ways had departed from what the Constitution really said in areas such as religious liberty, and crime, uh, relationship between the states and the federal government, and so on. And so uh, this in itself was quite something new. Uh, the press played it up that I was, uh, that we were all wrong, that we were trying to uh, uh, disrupt uh, the orderly following of, of the jur jurisprudence and so on. And uh, it probably would have just ended at that point, except uh, a few months later it, at Georgetown Law School, um, the, uh, uh, I guess it was Justice Brennan yeah. uh, decided to, to provide a, a speech trying to refute what I had said in July. And so uh, the fact that he was taking an opposing view then made a debate out of it. And then, of course, uh, one of the other justices joined in later on. And uh, as a result, it became a major aspect of, of uh, legal attention by the, the legal profession and judges, but also by the media and uh, the academic community as well. And so, uh, as I say, if it hadn't been for the fact that a, a debate ensued, 
it probably the my speech would have uh, lay on the shelves in people's library never to be read again. <laughs> but this now was a whole new idea, a new whole controversy, and uh, from that has come the whole idea of originalism or textualism or what I call fidelity to the Constitution and the laws as they're actually written. Yeah, obviously those of us involved in the conservative legal movement are, 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 are grateful to you and, and to Justice Scalia for picking up that, uh, that debate. We're also grateful to Justice Brennan for, uh, for right, deciding right. To, to take you on right. in, that, uh, in that Georgetown speech. Uh, so judges and the Supreme Court, uh, obviously the Reagan administration paid a lot of attention uh, to that. I know that your predecessor, William French Smith, had set up a committee on, on federal judicial selection during uh, the Reagan presidency. Uh, you had the opportunity to fill 368 out of the 761 federal judgeships, which was the highest percentage since the administration of Franklin Delano uh, Roosevelt. I, so I wanted to talk to you about about sort of how you, w you were involved in selecting judges. And then we'll talk specifically about the Supreme Court appointments mm -hmm. uh, that were there. So what was the philosophy in terms of picking judges? Well, the philosophy, again, was to find judges who would follow the concept of originalism or fidelity to the Constitution. And judges who had, had not only would do that, we felt, but who had proved it by their record, uh, what speeches they had given on the subject. Uh, if they were judges, or members of appellate courts, uh, what they had done with their decisions, and uh, and as well as uh, looking at their overall career and uh, and interviews by uh, of prospective judges, by uh, assistant assistant attorneys general, so that there was a background and a very careful vetting of the legal philosophy of potential candidates for the judiciary. And that was new, I gather. That betting well, that, process hadn't that, really that, existed. That was accentuated, at least, by uh, Bill Smith in the first four years and by me in the second four years. Okay. And I brought in people uh, to work on this as their sole job. People like Steve Markman, uh, people like uh, 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 Grover Reese and others, so that they would really emphasize the role of the Department of Justice in providing candidates for the president to select then people who would actually go out and be these kind of constitutional judges. So very early in the Reagan administration, in 1981, uh, there was a vacancy with the retirement of Potter Stewart, uh, and the president appointed the first uh, woman justice, Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, tell me about how that all came into being and, and what your involvement was in that. Well. <clears throat> During the campaign, this matter had come up, and the president said that it, if he could, was able to find qualified candidates, he wanted to see if he could appoint a judge, a justice, to the Supreme Court from among women lawyers and women judges. And uh, my predecessor, Bill Smith, headed that up, as you point out, and came up with uh, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, who had an interesting career. She had been a, a state legislator and also a state appellate judge uh, in Arizona. And uh, after careful vetting by, by Bill and his team, this was recommended to the president. And so she became, I was part of the uh, group in the White House that after the Department of Justice came with their recommendations, we, we would sit down with the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General and go over these candidates before they were presented to the president. Did you get an opportunity to meet with Justice O'Connor? I did not appointed? meet with her ahead of time. I met with her, uh, well, I did, I guess, before she was inaugurated, but uh, after she had been selected. Okay. Then there was quite a gap, uh, actually, uh, before there was another vacancy. And in 1986, uh, Chief Justice Berger, and, oh, uh, Sandra O'Connor, by the way, was, was confirmed 99 to nothing. You, you, you don't <laughs> see that anymore. Um, but in 1986, uh, Chief Justice Berger decided to retire. And so the president uh, elevated Associate Justice William Rehnquist and then nominated uh, Antonin Scalia for those positions. Uh, tell us about that. Okay. Uh, obviously, when there was a vacancy, uh, the president looked first to the court itself for the chief, since the chief justice position was vacant. And uh, Bill Winchrist had distinguished himself as being a truly faithful 
to the Constitution. And so uh, he was elevated to the chief's job uh, by the president's nomination. And then there was a vacancy then for his job. And there were two major contenders, Robert Bork and uh, uh, Anthony and Scalia. And so the president, it was a difficult choice because they were both excellent people, both had the same right uh, judicial philosophy. And so the president decided on the basis of age and health and potential longevity that uh, he didn't know whether he'd ever get another appointment. So, and for the, so that reason, he appointed Nino Scalia to uh, that job, keeping in mind that he would, that uh, he would, uh, if a new uh, another vacancy occurred, he would appoint or nominate uh, just a judge, uh, then judge uh, Bork. And so that's how it happened to be Scalia rather than Bork. As it turned out later on, uh, in terms of the longevity of the two men, uh, he was correct in anticipating who would live the longer. <laughs> well, that's that's true. Although replacing Rehnquist on the court uh, was less controversial than replacing Lewis Powell. So we'll get to that true. in just, uh, just a moment. So actually, at, at, at that confirmation hearing, uh, maybe it was expected, but Associate Justice Rehnquist ended up uh, getting all of the fire right. from his opinions. He, he was ultimately confirmed 60 Five to 33, and again, in, in a sign of the times, <laughs> Antonin Scalia was confirmed 98 to nothing. Uh, but then a year later, the, the swing vote at the time, uh, Lewis Powell decided to, to retire. And so the president uh, took on a fight and nominated Judge Bork. <clears throat> yes. Let's talk about that. Well, several things kind of came together. In 1986, the Democrats had won control of the Senate, so they had... They were thirsting to do something different in terms of almost everything, but particularly in the appointment of judges. And then in addition, in addition to that, uh, some uh, left-wing uh, groups had formed that had a very different judicial philosophy. Uh, they knew that, that liberals had a hard time getting their agenda through, through legitimate legislation and their idea was to try to get it through litigation, through the courts. And so they were looking for justices of the Supreme Court who would abandon fidelity to the Constitution and make up, uh, make up their decisions based upon their own policy ideas or political biases. And so that was why they came full out. Uh, and also, they were able to raise a lot of money on the outside for even to the point of television ads and so on. So that was why there was this massive uh, left-wing uh, counterforce against the president's nomination of Bob Bork. Well, the president stuck stuck with him. All the way to the end, and, and ultimately uh, he was defeated by vote in the Senate. But uh, the president had stuck with him, and Bob himself was, uh, I think, very stalwart and willing to go the extra mile to try very valiantly to take the position on the court. Yeah, it was, it was painful to watch those hearings, just as it was painful to watch the Clarence Thomas and Brett Kavanaugh right, right. Uh, hearings, too. So as you pointed out, Bork ultimately was defeated 58 to 42. And then the president uh, uh, nominated fellow Californian, uh, Anthony Kennedy. Well, uh, how did, he was confirmed 97 to nothing, but how did that all come about? Well, actually... Uh, well, uh, Doug Ginsburg was in between. Yeah, the there was a... Doug Ginsburg, and for various reasons, uh, decided to withdraw. And then uh, uh, the other one who had been under consideration was uh, Anthony Kennedy from, and President Reagan knew him personally from California days. And so uh, it, when uh, there was, the vacancy continued, uh, uh, the president nominated uh, Tony Kennedy, and I believe he was confirmed yeah, again by an overwhelming- 97 to nothing. Right. 97 to nothing. Uh, so one other thing that you, you did in terms of sort of the Constitution and judicial philosophy was you were very involved in a federalism task force. Can you talk just a bit about that? Yes, uh, the president, uh, I was at that time uh, chairman of the, what was called the Domestic Policy uh, Council, and uh, which were the members of the cabinet who had various aspects of domestic policy as opposed to the National Security Council, which I was a member of, but which had the national security responsibilities. So in the Domestic Policy Council, uh, we were, were very much interested in, uh, in 
and the president was interested in making sure that federalism was emphasized by all the government departments. And so he, he created a federalism task force to review regulations of the various departments to make sure that none of, or and also actions of the departments to make sure that nothing was being done by the federal government to usurp power that rightfully belonged under the Constitution to the various states and local governments. And so this was a very important aspect of, uh, from a different standpoint, looking at restoring the validity of the Constitution. So one of the things you mentioned about the president's support for freedom fighters ended up uh, causing some trouble uh, for him towards the end of his administration, uh, which is the Iran-Contra affair. So at the time, uh, and correct me if I get this wrong, Hezbollah had a handful of hostages in Lebanon, and there were negotiations going on behind the scenes with the Iranians as intermediaries, uh, and largely orchestrated by uh, by uh, you know Admiral John Poindexter and, and Colonel Oliver North. There were arms sales to the Iranians, and the funds that were generated from those arms sales were then diverted to the Contras uh, in Nicaragua. Uh, and when this came out. This was uh, obviously quite uh, quite a controversy. So if you could talk a little bit about the Iran-Contra affair and sort of your sure. role in addressing mm -hmm. that. All right. Well, when uh, basically you had two uh, situations that were separate from each other. One was the effort uh, to deal with the Ar Iran uh, because at the time that the president took over, we had had the hostages who were returned just as he was inaugurated. Right. But from that point on, we had no diplomatic relationship with Iran. And so there was an effort to <clears throat> reestablish some sort of a relationship with what were called uh, rational forces within the Iranian government. Uh, and in order to, and also to seek the help of the Iranians with, to get the hostages back from Hezbollah, uh, as you say, as an, as an intermediary. And also, part of the showing of good faith on the part of the Iranians was to help with the, with the hostages on the part of the good faith that uh, the United States would show would be to sell them uh, small quantities of defensive weapons, anti-tank and anti-aircraft equipment to, for them to use in their war with Iraq, uh, where we hoped that the two would essentially fight to a stalemate with nobody winning. So that was one uh, what you might call very secret, but all, and also very complex and uh, very volatile uh, pro policy strategy. On the other hand, you had the freedom fighters in Nicaragua, and uh, the because of some people in the in the Congress who were uh, opposed to the freedom fighters in Nicaragua, there was legislation passed that would prohibit anyone in the federal government from providing federal funds to the freedom fighters. Right. But they did say that the White House could solicit other governments or individuals to voluntarily provide funds. Well, one of the things that the people, this was being handled out of the National Security Council staff, the people you mentioned, and uh, when they asked Israel to uh, help with the funding of the freedom fighters, uh, one of the officials then in the government said that they didn't have any money, but why don't uh, they were helpful in the transfer of weapons to the, uh, or at least they knowledgeable about the transfer of weapons to the Iranians. They said, why don't you overcharge the Iranians for these weapons and then divert those funds to the freedom fighters? Well, of course, this was, uh, first of all, not legitimate. It was, uh, if not totally illegal, it was right on the borderline and really over the border, because you can't you have federal funds being diverted uh, or sent to other people for uh, even for a cause like uh, supporting freedom fighters. Money that's going outside or through the federal government has to go through appropriation and so on. So it was a matter where there was an excess of zeal and a deficiency of judgment on the part of the people who did this. So. But what the effect was, we were kind of like bringing gasoline and flames together. And there was a major explosion with uh, 
investigations by Congress and uh, potential real threat to the presidency. Ronald Reagan, of course, as soon as he found out about it, uh, he immediately took steps to stop it. He had knew nothing about it until it was discovered at the time that we were reviewing the testimony on the Iranian initiative to, uh, that was going to be taken uh, by in the congressional investigations. And uh, it was then that we'd, it was disclosed, we found out about these funds being diverted. The president immediately took action to uh, eliminate the people who were responsible in the NSC staff and, and to uh, convene a, a, an inquiry uh, to make sure that it never happened again and to uh, take whatever steps were necessary to let the public know. The first thing he said when he found out about this was, we've got to make a cl clean breast of this to Congress and to the public. So on this particular uh, day in, in November of, uh, of 1986, he first, at uh, the day after he found this out, the next day at... Uh, he brought in the cabinet and briefed them on what had happened. Next, he had a meeting with the leaders of both houses in Congress and both parties. And then at noontime, had a press conference in which this was revealed to the, whole, the entire public and the news media. And so the fact that he immediately took steps to correct the situation and that he also made sure that there was no cover-up and no concealment of any aspect of it really was uh, resulted in him uh, surviving what was really one of the worst uh, potential threats to his presidency. And I know that you were very involved in terms of sort of leading that investigation and getting the facts out quickly. Well, yes. Um, it actually wasn't, it did not start as an investigation. Mm -hmm. It really started as a means of, of taking these two uh, initiatives, which were very, uh, not only complex, they were also very secret. So different parts of the government knew different parts of it. And my job was really to get the information from the different components who had something to do with each of them and then be able to, or at that time, the Iranian initiative, be able to accurately testify before Congress. And it was during that, uh, looking at the facts, we came across the documents that uh, detailed this divestment of funds, the fact that the diversion of funds was taking place. And that's what really, uh, fortunately, was ahead of the news media or Congress in finding out what the wrongdoing that had taken place. Yeah, not an easy undertaking. And I know that you were very much the point person uh, for a lot, of, uh, a lot of that. So, Ed, obviously, uh, President Reagan had a very special relationship with his wife, Nancy. I was wondering whether you could describe a little bit about your relationship with Nancy Reagan. Well, I always had a, a good relationship with Nancy. Uh, I respected her, uh, but obviously her main purpose in life, uh, properly so in my opinion, was to be protective of her husband. And so uh, she was very definitely, that was her major goal, and uh, I certainly supported her with that idea. And so the one thing I didn't, I tried not to do would be essentially become a, a familiar family servant. Uh, I, I always wanted to re think of the president, uh, the governor originally, and then the president, as a friend who was my best client as a lawyer. I never wanted to be in a position where I would not tell him something that he needed to know because I was afraid he wouldn't like it. And so there was a certain, uh, let me say, a certain uh, stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, both Nancy and the president so that I would always be respectful of them and would never do anything that would not enable us to have a good cordial relationship, uh, but also an, an honest relationship, including saying things that they might not want to hear, but were necessary. Yeah, I know, a valuable commodity for a good lawyer to, to have. So after they left the White House, did you stay in touch with the president? Oh yes, Reagan? definitely. After they left the White House, uh, I continued at that point as vice chairman of the Reagan Foundation which built the library and stayed in that, that uh, position until the library was built and opened. And then after that, uh, later on, when the ranch was sold to the Young Americans Foundation, I became the uh, co-chairman of the Board of Governors of the Reagan Ranch Project. And I continue that to this day.
so when you finished up as attorney general, you could have gone to any law firm that you wanted, but you, you chose to remain involved in public policy through affiliations with the Heritage Foundation and Hoover Institute. Why did you decide to do that? Well, it was kind of interesting because even before I had a chance to look for a job as the Reagan uh, presidency was nearing the end, uh, the Heritage Foundation came to me with a job offer of full-time employment uh, and uh, the Hoover Institution, which I had been working with ever since the governor days for the, because they, they were the place where the president donated his uh, documents and papers as governor and I had a major part in that enterprise. And so they came to me with a similar uh, full-time job offer. So I was able to parlay it into, uh, in a sense, accepting both. Number one, I was interested in, in continuing public policy. So uh, we worked it out that I could be working full-time for Heritage and part-time for Hoover. So for 20 years, I commuted one week out of every month to go out to California to the Hoover Institution. The rest of the time I worked at the Heritage. And uh, as a result, I was, it was good because the two organizations had different approaches to the same thing, which was that the, pro the pro promotion of conservative philosophies and uh, uh, conservative uh, public policies. Were you tempted by private practice? Uh, well, I thought about it, but uh, the, these both two attractive job offers came at the same time, and uh, ultimately, the way in which we worked that out, I really ne never thought an awful lot about it other than that. Mm. So you were instrumental. Uh, you, we, you talked about Pacific Legal Foundation. You were also very instrumental uh, in, at the founding, or, or shortly thereafter, in promoting the Federalist Society and, and serving as a mentor. Uh, to its founders. Um, you've also served as an inspiration to many, many other groups involved in the conservative legal movement, which must give you a lot of, of satisfaction watching the conservative legal movement grow. What are your thoughts about how the movement has gotten to where it is and where you think it ought to be going? Well, uh, there were two aspects of this. Number one, the Heritage Foundation, when it was formed in 1973, was not just formed as a research organization but it was also formed to support other conservative groups in any way possible. And one of the ways that they chose was to support the legal organizations that had grown up since the Pacific Legal Foundation began in 1973. Uh, and other groups uh, were formed. Uh, several of them were formed, maybe half a dozen were formed in the late 70s, and then even more from that point on. So. Part of my work at the Heritage Foundation was to support and uh, help uh, organize and expand the work of the public interest law groups that had grown up since 1973 following the Pacific Legal Foundation. About a half a dozen of them grew up in the late 70s. And so uh, what we did was organize the public interest legal group for those that were headquartered in the Washington area and also to have uh, meetings of all the groups around the country at uh, various other times, uh, a couple of times a year. And so that was a part of it. As a result, uh, Heritage would help to foster and expand this, uh, what we might call the conservative legal movement. And then the other part of it was that uh, I was very fortunate in having on my personal staff uh, had been recruited the founders, all three of the founders of the Federalist Society, uh, Dave McIntosh, uh, Steve Calabresi, and uh, Lee, Lee, Lee Lieberman, uh, Lee Lieberman Otis. And so they were all working with me, so it was natural for me to uh, sort of be a mentor them, to them, but certainly to encourage this organization, which was a fledgling organization begun in the, about 1982, and certainly during the latter part of the 80s expanded dramatically as one of the most successful organizations in the conservative movement. I remember my, probably my first real introduction to Heritage other than by reputation was when I worked in the Bush administration attending those public interest legal right. meetings <laughs> that you used to host and that I, now I host. Uh, so where do you think the conservative legal movement is going, is going from here? Uh, there's an old saying that every political movement ultimately becomes a legal movement, uh, and that is because of the importance of litigation 
uh, and uh, things that are happening in legislation as well as litigation, uh, which have a legal aspect to them, and many of them will, in fact, many of these issues will, in fact, uh, wind up in court. And so to have a strong conservative legal movement is critical to ultimately winning the battle on a m- number of these important issues. So recently, President Trump uh, gave you the Presidential Medal of uh, Freedom. Uh, did, you, did you know President Trump, and, and what did receiving that award mean to you? Uh, I had met him a couple of times at social events, uh, usually at, uh, after the inauguration of, of his appointees to the Supreme Court, but it was uh, just a slight meeting at the, on those occasions. So I was totally surprised uh, and obviously very honored when one day he called me on the phone and asked if I would accept the, uh, the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom. And I was uh, obviously extremely pleased. It meant a lot to me because of the way in which he phrased it, that this was a recognition of the work that I had done with President Reagan and the work I had done in, in uh, matters of law and jurisprudence and that sort of thing. So uh, I was very, extremely pleased and honored that he would make that decision. Uh, I was honored you invited me to, uh, to that ceremony. It was really quite, quite a memorable, memorable day. It, it really was, and it showed a, a side of the president that was really impressive, uh, how empathetic he was towards me and particularly towards my family, how interested he was in the family, he spent a lot of time with them, particularly with my seven-year-old uh, great-grandson, uh, who he seemed to be impressed, the president seemed to be impressed with him and spoke about him in his remarks, actually. That was great. So one final question for you. How, you've had a remarkable career, a remarkable life. How do you want to be remembered? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a difficult question, but I think I'd, I'd like to be remembered as a person who is very grateful to God for the family that I have and for all the opportunities I've been given. Now, this has been a a real pleasure and a real privilege. Thank you so much, Ed, for, for doing this. Thank you.